God's restoration plan. If God is making all things new, and we as the body of Christ, the church of Jesus Christ, ought to contribute, then we need to understand what that looks like to us. We need to understand why is it that the Lord left us here. Have you ever wondered this? Why is it the Lord didn't save you and then take, he took you home? That would have been much easier. Actually, one of my friends, an evangelist in the in, in area of Chicago, his name was Lon Allison. He's already in the presence of the Lord. He used to say this. For God so loved the world that he sent Jesus to die for our sins, and he left us here. <laughs> for God so loved the world that he left us here. So I want to invite you today to see yourself an instrument of God. As an instrument in the hands of God, as a restoring instrument, redeeming instrument in the hands of God. And the Bible tells you very specific how is it that we do that. And we're going to let the Bible speak into our minds and into our hearts. So I need you to do me a favor again. Look at the person next to you and say this. You have to pay attention. Here we go. Look at what it says in Matthew chapter 5, starting in verse 13. Jesus said to his followers, you are, you are the salt of the earth. In verse 14, you are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Verse 15, neither do people like a lamp, uh, light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on a stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. So I want to spend some time thinking about what it means to be salt and what it means to be light. Ready? When the Bible talks about salt, it actually gives you two things that we gotta keep in mind. Number one, I think that we all know that salt gives flavor. Any salty people? I love salt. I don't enjoy sweets that much. But you give me something salty Mm. How about if I tell you that part of the reason why the Lord saved you is so you could bring flavor to this creation. That part of your responsibility as Christians is to bring flavor to this creation. The part of the reason, the, the reason why you are where you are and you have the work you have and the community in which you live is because you are there to be used by God so you bring flavor into this creation. And how about if I tell you that the Bible also tells you what that flavor looks like. This is what the Bible calls the fruit of the Spirit. You know what flavor looks like? If someone that is a person of love, a person of joy, a person of peace, a person of perseverance, a person of kindness, a person of goodness, a person of faithfulness, a person of gentleness, and a person of self-control. That's how we bring flavor into this creation. That we live in such a way that the things we say are so beautiful that everyone in our circle should be able to say, why is it that they have that I need that the reason why the Lord saved you is so you could be salty to bring flavor to this creation. Yeah, how about if you gain glory? There's a second reason why salt is important. And it's because salt is a preservative. It keeps things from going from bad to worse. It protects. It keeps think things from going from bad to worse. How about if I tell you that the reason why the Lord saved you and where you are where you are is because the Lord wants you to play a preservative role. That you are there to bring truth and beauty and justice and light. That you are there for a reason. And if you want to know how that looks like, then we have to go back to the fruit of the Spirit. 
And listen, I'm about to get super, super personal because there's one thing that I know about Christians, whether it's in this part of the world or in America or Latin America, is that sometimes, just sometimes, we really don't display the spirit, the spirit of God. So I want to tell you what, how is it that, that a Christian looks like, not only when we bring flavor, but when we play the role of a preservative. We are people of love instead of hate. Amen? We are people of joy instead of anger. Amen? We are people of peace instead of war. Amen? We are people of perseverance instead of giving up. Amen? We are people of kindness instead of vengeance. Amen? We are people of goodness instead of selfishness. Amen? We are people of faithfulness instead of betrayal. Amen? We are people of gentleness instead of harshness. Amen? We are people of self-control instead of simply following our desires and appetites. That's how we preserve this creation. This is the reason, church, why we share the gospel. This is the reason why we are people of compassion. This is the reason why we care for the least of these. This is the reason why we love in word and in deed. But this is also the reason why we work. See, this category of work for many Christians is not something spiritual. So, so let me use a, a, a theological concept. Some theologians talk about this thing called spiritual dualism, in which the tendency is for some believers to think that there are some things that are more spiritual than others. Like coming to church is a spiritual, amen? Reading the Bible is a spiritual. Praying is a spiritual. Giving money is a spiritual. Serving is a spiritual. And we would always say, Amen. But that is not the only thing is spiritual. Because if you are a believer, everything you do, everything I do is for the glory of God. Therefore, everything we do is spiritual, including how we work and why we work. Isn't that the reason why God created Adam and Eve? This is pre-fall. Before sin entered the world, God creates Adam and Eve and puts them to work. He puts them to work the garden and to take care of it. See, as Christians, I don't think that we have permission to create this spiritual dualism. See, I think that as Christians, we should see your job, your career, your work as something spiritual. And I'm going to give you two arguments why. Number one is because when you work and whatever you are doing, you are actually a reflection of who God is in this creation. You reflect God not only by how you work, but by the things you do when you work. This is where I got this from. I think that when we, look, when we think of our, about our jobs, we have to see it this way. Our work is missional. We are bringing truth and beauty and restoration and justice and holiness and all these things into this creation. There was a missionary years ago, Amy Wilson Carmichael. She was a, a missionary to India. And this is what she said. There are farmers, because God was the first farmer, there are doctors, nurses, and paramedics, and doctors and nurses because God was the first divine healer. There are engineers because God was the first engineer. There are accountants because God was the first accountant. There are business people because God was the first businessman. There are communicators because God was the first communicator. There are builders because God was the first builder. How about if I tell you that part of how we become salt in this creation is by learning to see our jobs and our career in a completely different, from a completely different perspective. Our work is missional. 
Actually, let me push it a little bit more. Not only you reflect something about God with your work, but God uses your work to bring restoration to this creation. Another lady that I learned this from, her name is Amy Sherman. She talks a lot about this. She, she wrote this book years ago called Kingdom Calling. And this is what she says. God does redemptive work. God is in the business of redeeming things. Therefore, if you are an evangelist, a counselor, a pastor, or a peacemaker, you are doing the redemptive work of God. God does creative work. God is a creator by nature. Therefore, if you are an actor, a painter, a musician, a poet, a designer, a carpenter, or an architect, you are contributing to the creative work of God. God does providential work. God provides and he sustains. Therefore, if you are a social worker, a farmer, a fireman, a police officer, a banker, a painter, a technician, you are contributing to the providential work of God. God does justice work. God is in the business of bringing justice. Therefore, if you are a judge or a lawyer or a government official or a diplomat or a law enforcement, you are reflecting something about the justice of God. See, God is in the business of doing compassionate work. He brings comfort and healing and guiding and shepherding. Therefore, if you are a doctor, a nurse, a psychologist, a therapist, a community worker, you are contributing to the compassion of God. God reveals things. He reveals truth. Therefore, if you're a preacher, a scientist, an educator, a journalist, a scholar, or a writer, you are contributing to the revelatory work of God. See, this is the thing, church. If you work, you are being used in the hands of God as an instrument of redemption and restoration. So I need you to do me a favor. Look at the person next to you and say this. You live for something much bigger than yourself. Can I tell you a story? I have 40 seconds according to that screen, but they say that I have plenty of time. <laughs> this story called, is called the, the Leaf of Nigel. It's a story that Tolkien, the writer Tolkien, wrote years ago. And if you know anything about you guys heard the story of uh, um, Lord of the Rings story? That was the writer. You know that he, it took him 40 years to write that piece of work. 40 years. But in between, he wrote this little story called The Leaf of Nigo. And this is basically the story. There was an artist that wanted to paint this beautiful tree. Kind of the beautiful trees that we see in this amazing part of the world. And he was so obsessed with that tree that he started to paint the tree one leaf at a time. So he grabbed the first leaf and he painted it little by little. But because he's, he was so obsessed with that, he's putting all the details and one day turns into two days, and two days turns into one week, and one week into turns to plenty of weeks, and then months, and he dies. And he only got to paint one leaf. So he makes it to heaven, and when he's in heaven, from afar, he sees this beautiful tree, which was the tree that he had imagined. And he goes to the tree. And guess what he sees in that tree? His leaf. You know why that story is so important? Because your job and my job is not to paint the tree. That's God's business. Your job and my job is to be salt. Is to paint our leaf. Is to do our part. Is to love with words and love with deeds and love the way we work and how we work. So how about light? Because not only salt is important, but light is important. Look at what Matthew chapter 5 verse 16 says. Let your light shine before others that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. You know why that's important, church? One simple reason. Your faith 
It's a public faith. We don't run from this world, you know. We don't hide from this world. Our faith is a public faith. There is a reason why you work where you work. There is a reason why you, why you live where you live. There is a reason why you have the neighbors you have. There is a reason why you are in the schools in which you are. There is a reason why God placed you where you are. So with this I finish. How can anybody then become an agent of restoration? See, this is the thing. I think that part of the reason why we don't care about this world that much is because we care way too much about us. Actually, I think that part of the reason why sometimes we don't work the way we're supposed to work is because we think that our work is our identity. I am, if I work, I am the job I have. I am all these things. I think that part of the reason why we don't know how to love other people is because sometimes we are just super self-centered. But I'm here to tell you that there's a way for you to change. That there's a way for you to be transformed. And it's when you remember that at one point you were Genesis chapter 3. That you remember that at one point your, your relationship with God was completely broken. When you remember that your relationship with other people was completely broken. So you need to remember that. But the other thing that you need to remember is that God so loved you that he, not, he did not leave you in your misery. That God so loved you that he wanted to bring restoration not only to this creation but to your life. And that the way he brought restoration to your life is by having another Adam, the greater Adam, that will come and live the life that none of us have lived and die the dead that we all deserve and resurrected to give you a new identity, a new personality, a new purpose for life. See, this, these are the two questions that people always ask. Who am I and why do I live for or what's my purpose? Two questions. Did you know that if you're a believer, you already know who you are? You are in Jesus Christ. You are the son of God. You have been adopted. You have been sanctified, separated for God. You have been justified, declared righteous. You are already someone to God. And not only are you already someone to God, but you have a purpose. You are called to be an instrument in the hands of God. So we get the picture of, of Ed. Of, of the Garden of Eden all over again. So we contribute to what the Lord is going to do in the future. So we get to live our Christianity in a completely